our last session. We had an interesting lunch ourselves, so many ideas boiling up, or b gently bubbling up in some cases, <laughs> boiling in others. <laughs> Lots, uh, so much that we feel that we could have discussed that we did not. A lot of joy in what we have discussed and an excitement uh, about uh, possibilities for the future. I just want to say something about uh, the structure of this afternoon before we uh, begin this session. So just right now, actually, two of our number, that is to say, Tutin Jimbala and uh, uh, Venerable Mathieu Ricard, are in a, in a session, in a meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, perhaps discussing the next iteration of, of our Mind and Life uh, events of this kind. Uh, so we will go ahead and begin without them. His Holiness will be joining us. His Holiness has a very bu busy schedule today, and he will be joining us a little bit later in the session. Uh, we will then continue our conversation with him until about uh, 2.30. Each of our number will give a, a sort of concise statement uh, to His Holiness when he comes. We'll have a final discussion, hear from His Holiness, and then we'll hear from uh, some folks in Mind and Life and we'll close out the day. We will not have a question session this afternoon. So it's been quite a full week, certainly for me at least. Uh, fascinating, I've learned a great deal myself. I, thought, I think that one of the main issues that we face, that we know we face, is that we are now, in a to a certain degree, responsible for some very found, profound changes happening to our planet. And so we call this time the Anthropocene. Uh, the good news about that, of course, is that uh, since we've made the mess, maybe we can clean it up, too. And that's part of the message that I hear from what Diana Liverman had to say. It's a very important message. It's a message about not only the problems, but also, also the possibilities of, this, of solutions. You know, Jonathan actually quipped that uh, when we try to put, make an a species go extinct, we can't. But when we do it by accident, we seem to be pretty good at it. But that also suggests is that there as well, there is a capacity, a human, a tremendous human capacity to correct these problems, to do something about it. We have those capacities and we're learning how to harness them. And Greg's work, of course, shows that there's not only a footprint, but a handprint. The ways in which all of our, uh, our economic activities and consumer activities spread out through the world also gives us an opportunity to do something positive. And Claire's work shows us that even despite the great complexity of the ethical difficulties, we can certainly find common ground and we can keep those ethics in mind as we go forward. All of these are incredible possibilities. They offer hope for the future. The wild space in which we live, part of ourselves is already in a wild space, according to Sally. That wild space is something that we can tap into to see the world differently, to gain a new perspective. So part of what we want to do this afternoon, drawing on, uh, on all of our collective work, such as Elka's work about the way in which we can foster positive environments for decisions, rather than being overwhelmed by the negative. Tutan Jimpala's work, his presentation of the Buddhist approach, which involves that sense of both a commitment, a dedication, and a kind of mindfulness of keeping our eyes on the prize, so to speak, keeping ourselves aware of what's important. All of those together can combine in successful activism, such as what Degula spoke about. So I think that we can certainly see that there are problems, and maybe some of us have become a little bit overwhelmed by the immensity of the problems over the course of the week. But we'd like to focus especially now on steps, on next steps, and to a certain degree on what we might be able to do, even fairly concretely, as we move forward. So I'm just going to invite our participants now in that spirit to start our conversation. Who would like to lead off? Well, um, some of my friends and colleagues have been watching this on the web and they sent some emails saying, just remind people of some very simple things they can do to stop us getting to the planetary boundaries. So I just wanted to mention a few of those. And they're really simple, and they don't take too much mindfulness. It's take a short shower. I mean, 
it saves so much water if you have a Define low flow. Define short for us, if Five, you would. I'll give you exact data. If you install a low flow shower head and offer to do that for your neighbors, sometimes people just don't know how to go buy one. You can buy it as a Christmas present for your neighbor and install it. Um, but if you install a low flow shower head and change your showers from 10 minutes to five minutes, your water use in the United States goes from 20 gallons to five gallons. That's an enormous saving. Wow. Um, if, you, if you're in a hot area and you have air conditioning or fans, just turn the thermostat up two degrees. You probably won't even notice. Or make sure you only have one fan on to sleep under at night. If you're in a cold area, then you can turn the thermostat down and wear some nice woolies. And this makes an enormous difference on your energy use. It can really reduce your greenhouse gases for the year. And then the third one, which is the one I've tried to promise to myself, is to not take as many flights and to take advantage of the improved video conferencing. Because I think you can share affection with people using video conferencing now. You can see their face. You can work very well with people. And when you do fly, do many things. And the only thing I would say, I mean, this flight here, I did many things. I learned a lot. I tried to share some knowledge. And I made some really wonderful new friends. So that's all I want to say. <laughs> OK. Um, well, I have been thinking about uh, the attempts at the international level and the national level to take on environmental sustainability, to have environmental treaties, to pass policy. And, and there's been a lot of frustration. And I would like to endorse what Bill Clinton and uh, Michael Bloomberg have done. And the, the Clinton Foundation now has a climate change initiative where they emphasize cities that things need to happen at the local level, uh, and, and cities are a place to really uh, make things happen. And of course, there are all sorts of things at the personal level that we need to do. And I would say at the personal level, get engaged with your urban planners and get engaged with, with city politics uh, and, and policies. And there's some great examples of um, from Norway to Chicago on, on putting green vegetation on your roof. Green roofs, uh, it, it, it cools the, uh, the, the climate in the summertime. It prevents flooding and from excessive rainfall and runoff. So there's something, you know, green roofs. Another city in Bogota, uh, Bogota, Colombia, did this amazing change where they took out a lane of the expressway and they turned it into a bus train that's been fabulous. And now there are other cities around the world copying that. So I think you know, getting engaged at the local level uh, and, and each intervention will depend on where, you're, where you live, what that intervention would be, would be uh, selected as having the best impact. Are, are there other examples? I'm just curious. Uh, in my community, for example, a certain kind of res a trash compactor that somehow works, as I recall, with a wireless communication was installed throughout the community. This is in Decatur, Georgia. And uh, it seems to reduce the, ma the amount, or at least the, uh, the, the, the overall size of the trash that is produced by the, by the city considerably. Are there other kinds, are there, I mean, in other words, what you're proposing is you go to your city hall or you uh, just become aware somehow of the urban planning or do, you, do people concretely get together and, and make proposals? How does this kind of thing work in your experience? Well, I, I think, uh, again, it depends on, I, I think my key message is to engage in local initiatives, and mm -hmm. there are many. There, there are many at the urban level, but even at the rural level you know, on farms, there are biodigesters where you take the manure and you can use it for fuel. So I think what I'm saying is that for each location, uh, there'll be a different intervention. There'll be places with lots of wind, and, and uh, you can be putting up wind farms. Of course, because everything is interdependent, you need to have the knowledge of ecology and, and ornithology to know where the bird migration routes are so you don't put your windmills in the wrong place. So. Um, 
Yeah. Yes, Mathieu. Yellow. Circle. Yeah. yeah. Just this morning, I got an email from a French friend who devised a system for a 2,000 inhabitant small, what do you call, commune or city to reduce 40% of energy consumption. On the base of that, he's now trying to <coughs> gather 2,000 mayors of similarly sized village or large villages to follow the same procedure. So because he have a working example. So there's all grassroots initiatives by what a few do people. They actually do to reduce well, he hasn't said that. Ah. <laughs> but I mean, it's a, I guess it's, you know, it's all series of measures. But the thing is, the process starts from one determined person to make a, think a few years to make a plan. And once it seems to be working, then to, to have the ripple effect. And it seems that this, there's a lot of response from, from mayors. So at a certain extent, what you're saying is there is already a lot of information out there available to those who might be able to bring success actions, success examples of successful urban action into their own community if they're living in a city. Sounds like what you're suggesting. So it's not necessarily that a private individual has to see to it that, you know, a windmill farm is, is produced, but rather that one can make this, one can make one's own city government aware of these possibilities. Is that part of what we're suggesting? The guy got passionate about that, so he sort of, what, I don't know exactly what he did, but he's, I hope it's a sound proposal, and he applied it in that village. It works fine. They reduce whatever consumption. And then, yeah. based on that, he sort of uh, you know, said, look, here's the result, and he convinced, uh, he's now convening 2,000 mayors. I don't know how many in France. There are 60,000 small uh, you know, cities, but at least 2,000 of them are ready to take up that challenge. Let me just add to that. There's a more systematic way, a, a town or a community, any organization, a university, a hospital can take advantage of the methodology Greg presented to do more sustainable sourcing by uh, every hospital, every university, every town has a lot of buying power, large purchasing budget every year. And if the person in charge of that uses uh, the kind of tools that Greg has, they can favor more sustainable paper, more sustainable cement, more su whatever it is they're buying, which then has, a, as we saw, a huge ripple through the supply chain. Ahead, Maybe yeah. to build on that, Dan, you know, yesterday we heard Jonathan uh, express that our, it seems that some of our societies are addicted, or I think you, you might have said we are addicted to oil, but I, I reflected that people aren't addicted to oil, but our infrastructure is, that means uh, our houses are, our, our appliances are, uh, and our cities are. And <laughs> support for this fact comes from research that compares, uh, they, they, first they found out as Dan said, they studied the detailed purchasing habits of households in Europe. And from that they used life cycle assessment to calculate the comprehensively their environmental impacts in a year. They also asked these households what they felt and cared about the environment. They were hoping to see that caring deeply about the environment led to low impacts, but they found not much correlation, mm. a little but not much, to their surprise. So they explained this by saying conscientiousness about the environment changes our decisions on a daily basis, but there are a few moments in our life where we have decisions that make a huge impact because of their long-term nature. And that's th such things as uh, where you live, um, when you buy a car, which is a 10-year or 15-year commitment to energy use, what kind do you buy? What is your house uh, energy efficiency and size? And even your income. So How you heat. Yes. And how you heat, that's right. So I think the, the message is not that we ignore the daily practice, because as we know, daily practice helps raise awareness, but bring the daily practice insights. Make sure you bring them to those key moments in life where we make huge infrastructure decisions. And a way to implement that at the community level where it's also very important is um, through such things as building codes. And for example, Washington DC passed a, I guess a, a law or regulation that says all new construction and all renovation in Washington DC must be compliant with US Green Building Council standards. Once you make that one decision, that's going to, uh, that, that's essentially creating a deep habit in a city. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Just add to that, 
And we talked a lot about mindfulness here, and it turns out that institutions don't have a mind. But institutions oftentimes are responsible to the people they are there for. And so to the extent that we learn lessons on how to reduce our own imprint, footprint, we can now put pressure on our institutions and make them mindful by making the collection of people that, uh, that, that they're responsible to uh, influence them in different ways. And you know, there's a lot of inertia in our own behavior. There's even more inertia in institutions. And I think we are responsible for changing our institutions. That means going to planning board meetings, doing lots of, you know, sort of, uh, oftentimes, you know, sort of boring and, and, and labor-intensive things. But in, in the aggregate, they do make a huge difference, and probably more than our individual behavior. So vote and lobby. Vote and lobby. Are there good resources for those who want to become interested in local initiatives? Can anyone recommend a resource that someone could use to learn about local initiatives, to s learn about successful ones? I've got something in mind, but yes, Diana? Uh, Mathieu and I were just discussing, and there is one uh, organization that is an organization of cities all across the world. Um, called ICLEI, I-C-L-E-I, and they have a program called Cities for Climate Protection, where cities share information about successful strategies. And for corporations, there's um, one uh, program is the Carbon Disclosure Project, where they produce annual reports where you can see all the things that businesses have done to try to reduce their environmental impact. So. Both of those can be easily found on the web, both ideas for corporations and ideas for cities. Uh, I would also, while Joan is uh, getting a mic together there, I'll also put in a plug for my, my co-organizer of the meeting, Dan Goldman, who wrote a book actually called Ecological Intelligence that also covers some success stories and some, not only the bad news, but also a lot of good news in terms of how, what approaches one can take in order to really make a difference, actually. And it seems to me that grass, one of the messages we're definitely getting is grassroots is important, as Dikula's work also uh, is in a testimony to, right? Being, working at the local level in a grassroots way can really make a difference. I think uh, it goes beyond that and back to the individual. I, we're talking multi-level change. And uh, I, I was very moved by a book Pico Ayer wrote about His Holiness. It's a wonderful book. But in the last page of that book, he describes that they've just had a meeting and they're leaving the room. They close the door and His Holiness stops, goes back and turns off the light. <laughs> and that really impacted me. I started to, to do that. And I think to the extent each one of us becomes more mindful about the little ways in which we could do better, cumulatively, Ag in an aggregate, it will have a huge difference. Over a lifetime, yes. No question about it. Joan, you wanted to add something? And then Sally and Claire, yes? To, to bring up the issue of transparency, both personal transparency and public transparency, including corporate and governmental transparency. And I think in a way this meeting has been a model of that. I appreciated um, you disclosing your vegetarianism, and I appreciated the fact that His Holiness said I'm not entirely a vegetarian. <laughs> I mean, you know, those kind of, if you uh, will, personal audits, but also audits of your own patterns of consumption, which are greatly aided by your work, Greg. And then, you know, um, putting pressure on communities co and corporations and our government to um, disclose uh, exactly this kind of information, I think is really critical. And apropos of a comment that you made, Mathieu, about, I think it was you who made it, um, monasteries being a little competitive and wanting to outdo each other and, you know, doing good, being good and doing good, um, you know, that, that uh, heart set, uh, when we say competition for uh, the better, so to speak, which in a way debate is about, the model of deba Tibetan debate is about, it's exactly that heart set, I think, that is that really important that, you know, we sort of have that, uh, the sense of incredible determination and commitment to, um, to fulfill what we feel are, is the highest good. I, and that, uh, that issue of transparency, I think, is really critical. I have a data point on that, Joan. Uh, about uh, 25 years ago, the U.S. government required factories and production sites to report their admissions all they had to do was report how much of this goes into the air, how much of this goes into the water, how much of that goes into the soil. That was the only requirement, transparency. 
Since then, they have reduced emissions by 75%. Wow, that's, that is impressive indeed. Sally, you had something. Yes, um, I wanted to expand a little bit on the planetary house rules um, in which we treat our house uh, not like a hotel, but like a home. And everybody who lives in the house reads the rules that are put on the refrigerator every morning when you get up. And uh, the first one is take only your share. And what does this mean at an individual level? Well, it's difficult to figure out, but at least we know that most of us are taking too much. The whole, the whole call for restraint and limitation is very important. At the, what does it mean at the public level? That is more complicated. But as a quick illustration, during the Second World War, we had rationing. And you know what? People during the Second World War felt good about some things, and it, one of them was that everybody was on the same ration book. And uh, we, could, uh, as we, we could legislate something like public limitation of resources. The second point, clean up after yourself. Well, a lot of us are recycling, and that's wonderful, and that's what we ought to be doing. What does this mean at a public level? Well, at a public level, it should mean not punishing companies after they've already uh, trashed the environment, like the Exxon Val Valdez, but at the, at the beginning, what market capitalism does not do is figure in the cost to nature at the front end of a product. So that we ought to be paying more for our products in order so that we could recycle more instead of just punishing at the end of it. And thirdly, keep the house in good repair for others. Um, at a local level, one of the things is to educate your children well. We have focused so much on the importance of the next generation and many environmentalists have said that deep down, we're all generational people. We want, whether we have children of our own, we want the next generation to flower. And many teachers act as mentors uh, and as if their students were children, wanting, them, wanting to educate them as deeply and well as possible. And at the public level, I'm from Canada, and the First Nations there talk about seven generations into the future. That is, the decisions we make are not just for now, but we have to figure out how to do it in the future. Um, and um, so I think these, these are, uh, they sound rather, I mean, when you try to um, apply these rules at a planetary level, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. So if you keep on your refrigerator, Put on your refrigerator these three rules. Um, take only your share, clean up after yourself, and keep the house in good repair for others. That sounds like a very practical approach, especially if you're using an energy efficient refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, did you have a follow up on that, Jimbala? Well, actually, I was going to. Um, I mean, I, you know. All the speakers have today uh, focused on solutions and the practical steps that each of us can take and also the, the kind of pressures we can put on um, the various levels of institutions so that, um, and I think I really appreciate Greg's point that um, uh, a change that is made at the institutional level has much larger impact. Uh, and I wasn't surprised that the study did not find that much correlation between people's actual energy consumption versus their environmental consciousness because the kind of lifestyle that we lead, particularly in the more developed countries, is so consumer kind of based, um, consumption based, that um, you know, in some ways there isn't much room left in the individual's own choice areas to make a huge impact. I think that is a very important point. The one point that I would like to bring into the discussion here and which we haven't sort of covered um, over the last few days is kind of an ethical question that people from the developing countries have raised um, on the whole question of environmental protection because environmental protection demands lesser consumption you know and it is a sort of a, a very skeptical kind of question mark being put on the whole consumerist model of economy as well as you know, um, society and so on. And a lot of, um, um, you know, in the early days uh, from the third world countries, the developing countries, people have raised the moral question that why should we in the developing countries who are now making a progress in, you know, uplifting our standard of life should care 
more about the world when the develop, developed countries had cut down all their rainforests and have consumed all of this through the industrial age. So that question, I think, is an important moral question. Um, you know, not, not necessarily at the individual level, but at the societal level. Because in a sense, you know, environmental protection, in whatever way, does demand sacrifices on the part of economic development, at least on the pace of development. So that's one important question which we really haven't really looked at. And we don't want to be accused of being naive on that point. And it, it is an important moral question. The second question is, you know, we haven't really looked at, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have an economist among us to look at, you know, what are the economic costs of the kind of solutions we are proposing, the, 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 the lesser consumptions that uh, you know, we are proposing to each individual. So again, that is you know, for people who are at the receiving end, you know, workers and so on, that has a real material impact on the reduction of the earning, the loss of job. So I think this is something that I wanted to put on table. Maybe I may be kind of so the first muddying question, the water a bit. But no, no, not at all. I'm, the, the first question, I, I'm not sure I understand exactly what the first question is. I mean, the first question seems to be saying there's the, f there's the possibility of environmental regulations that come at a cost. And well, you're at a global to level. The, that, that's, that's where there was some discussion on the developed countries paying some kind of environmental you know, redressing of balance to protect the rainforest in Brazil and economic, uh, kind of ecological zones yes. in the developing countries. So that's basically based on that. It's coming from that line of moral argument. Yeah, I wonder mm. if our ethicists would unpack that moral argument further. I mean, how do we, how do we understand that argument? What's, you know, where does it have its bite, so to speak? It's a sense of fairness, basically. It's an argument from sense of fairness. Mm. Yes, and there are several different kinds of arguments. There are arguments that look back to the past and that say, this is particularly in relation to climate change, say, well, it's the developed countries essentially that produce the greenhouse gas emissions, um, and so they should carry special responsibility for being the ones to, to fix the problem since they essentially caused it. And it would be particularly unfair to now turn around to nations who didn't cause the problem and say, well, you, you now have to cut your emissions so you can't develop in the way that we did. So you're carrying the burden of the thing that we did uh, that's put you in this situation. So there's a kind of historical argument about that. And there are also arguments that the, the developed countries, because they're richer, are just in a better position to, to deal with these kinds of problems than the developing countries that have to focus on making their own population um, able to live better than they're currently doing. So those are the, the main kinds of arguments. So those are historical arguments and distributive arguments about uh, climate justice. But I think that either Diana, Diana may, may be able to say more about the actual uh, policies that there have been in some of the international climate negotiations that have a transfer of resources from uh, the richer to the, to the, to the, less, uh, to the less developed countries. Um, well, just briefly, in the absence of um, an international agreement, there has been agreements to transfer money from the developed to the developing countries. There's a $30 billion fund underway right now to help with adaptation and mitigation. There's a commitment of $100 billion by 2020. And some of that money goes to energy efficiency in the developing world, some of it goes to helping the developing world adapt, which we haven't talked much about, actually. I wish we had. And uh, the other part goes to a fund to protect the world's forests, uh, which is a form of mitigation. But I would say, uh, in terms of personal solutions, um, there also needs to be some north-south transfer on a personal level. And I wanted to make a plea not to forget that there's an enormous amount of suffering that charities like Oxfam and others help to relieve. And I know uh, that um, they often don't have enough money. Like with the Pakistan floods, the money ran out. So those of us who can afford to give need to give to help alleviate suffering from today's climate disasters. And it, we need to remember to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, in a very obvious way that individuals can really concretely support this kind of work is to enable NGOs 
and other, other groups to become involved in projects that really have already can demonstrate some degree of success. So important, I think, whether it's in, in the environment or other kinds, of, as, you, as you put it, North-South Exchange. But Roshi, you had a comment. Jimbalai, I, did I misunderstand you when I heard you say that um, the impacts, the negative impacts from uh, consumption by individuals is less consequential than the impacts vis-a-vis -vis corporations? I, you know, I... No, 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 no. good. No, but no, he the, said... What I was saying that um, yeah. if the institution, if the society is structured in, in a way that is consumer-based and driven, then there is much smaller room for individual behavior change that to have an impact okay, on your... Thank you. Yeah, yeah, but I do want to clarify, and, and before we turn to Matthew, that I did hear you say, you, you seem to suggest that individual lifestyle changes didn't matter very much. No, 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 no I didn't mean that. I don't think that's you mean yeah. that. That's no, no, in, in, yeah. in comparison to institutional level change, the impact is going to be a lot larger uh, Although, there. Greg, you can tell us, and I'm going to turn Greg to you Greg and Mathieu both have data to Yeah, I mean, you can that. tell us that actually choice, it, didn't you tell me at some point that the main uh, issues in turn are heating of homes, choice. correct? Uh, mostly private homes, is that correct? And what else was it? Could you remind us? So, I mean, I think, uh, first my point was that there's a lot of inertia. If you start today caring about your footprint, your, your impacts, you find that you've already made decisions in the past that have sure. huge consequence. Sure. It's your income and it's the house, where you live and the size of your house and how it's heated. Now, what do you do next? Uh, so those it, are sort it, of the main factors, yeah. where you live? That's right, where you live and the size of your house. And how it's heated. How it's heated somewhat, uh, that's important, but it's the big ones are how much you earn and where you live, distance from work and, and shopping and other activities. Uh, and then um, how your home, uh, well, the size of your home, because in general, energy use in the home for heating and cooling is proportional to size. I feel I'm speaking to the rich people with homes here and, and, and apartments. Uh, there is also absolutely air, air travel. I mean, city dwellers are much more efficient, except that they fly more, and it cancels out. It, believe it or not, the flying, the extra flying that city dwellers do cancels out in general the, the, the fact that they, they drive so much less and use public transportation. Um, I guess I, I, two messages in addition. So you, you asked that studies show very concretely there are three areas of spending where we have our biggest impact. It's diet, home heating and cooling, and transportation. So that's where you look first. Second, if you're discouraged because you already have a big home or you, you have to travel for work or something, you can have a big handprint. You, you, you shrink your footprint as much as you can, but then create positive change. The third point is uh, be, most of these things you do, flying less, shorter showers, uh, turn back the thermostat, ride your bicycle more, you're going to save a lot of money. And you must be really careful what you do with that money. <laughs> if, you, if you just spend that money on... <laughs> a vacation in Tahiti. Yeah. Over. Right, the, the, the benefits are gone. But, but so what can we do? Well, that's right. So basically you have savings. You, you have sort of three things I, you know, that, that I could mention. One is put it in a retirement fund. In fact, arrange to have those savings automatically put retirement and retire early. And you know, we're hoping to add in this web-based tool the ability to calculate how much sooner you're retiring. And you tell your friends they're missing out because you're retiring and then, sooner. Then become a volunteer in an NGO. Exactly. Yeah, retire, then volunteer <laughs> in it, retire early, volunteer. Retire early. Yeah. No. We need a better word for retirement. I was discussing at tea break. Something like graduate from the workforce into a, a you know, a fuller life into of voluntary action. Mm. Absolutely. Second, save for this was a, one of the one of the members in our audience had the idea: save for your children's college. I mean, that's a no-brainer, but it's also something that would, <laughs> needs to happen. And, and third, contribute to charities and other organizations. By, by doing that with your savings, uh, it's a win-win. Yeah. Now, I, I just want to finally say sure. we, we have serious work to do on Jimpola's point of addressing what happens to the people, the, the people at the margins of our economies when those of us who have the luxury to increase our well-being by less lowering consumption, that's great for us. But, but we really need to engage with economists deeply, just like people need to engage with other religions,
to ask, okay, here's what we have in mind, reduction of consumption. Please help us figure out how to engineer this so that the people who are struggling at the edge of the economy can actually get better and not worse. And, and not become major consumers themselves and have their identity also associated well, with yes. co consumption. Yeah. But, but I think you didn't make it. Is, is your point that when we consume less, a lot of people lose their jobs? My point is actually if we consume less, uh, it, it, potentially the economy shrinks and the money flowing even to developed country goes down a bit. Now, in our own company, in our own countries, this is why I thought of early graduation from the workforce. You step out of that job into uh, activities of more fulfillment to you, and you leave that job space for, for people who are coming into the economy. Unemployment is a real problem in the developed world. So early graduation uh, helps the employment issue, but that doesn't solve. Dan mentioned my research, which is very, very preliminary, but it says that, that you know some of our money we're spending reaches it promotes economic development uh, in other countries, well, and we've got yeah. to address that too. Yeah, it seems like in some ways we are sort of looking for the emergence of a new paradigm. I mean, it's really interesting to note that sort of rampant... Please a new paradigm. Please a new paradigm. A new economic paradigm. And it seems not like a paradigm of growth. Not, yes, exactly. A paradigm of balance uh, in some sense, because it's, you know, um, it's interesting to a note that... A paradigm of generosity. Rampant consumerism, a sort of very heavy-duty consumer culture, certainly in the United States, mm -hmm. Um, uh, the ecological, environmental crisis, and uh, the tremendous fall in personal savings all go together. So it's, uh, it seems as if we're, we're, we're sort of just living on the edge. But I want to turn to, to Mathieu, who's been waiting patiently to make a comment. Yeah, I think the, the ethical case has been presented somehow, somehow in the extreme way, that the wealthy nation will slightly diminish, and then that the developing nation will just remain in abject poverty. So I think here we are typically of kind of a middle, middle way approach where uh, we need to bring out of poverty and have decent health, decent living, decent education for those who are. But then at some point, and then the, the wealthy nation should work on voluntary simplicity so to get, as his own says, to bridge the north-south right. gap. Right. But then the problem is what uh, we have been objecting is that the developing nations are just aiming at having two cars per house and everything. So that also, they should not overshoot. So then that could be very reasonable and ethically acceptable. The situation now is the boat is sinking. The first class passenger, even the boat is sinking, wants still to keep the AC on. And the second class passenger, only one dream is to be upgraded. So that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. <laughs> true. <laughs> How true. But I think it's, uh, sorry, yeah. no, go ahead, I go just ahead, wanted to respond. Yeah, I sure. think it's often, um, I suppose in the end, it's a question of um, uh, how yeah, messaging, because sometimes to ordinary people living in the third world country whose main emphasis is really on survival and their own economic development, the environmental message comes through as moralizing. And I think this is something that, in a sense, that's what I'm trying to get at. You know, we need to, unless we have a very compelling case, that it is in the interest right. of each of us, including people who are in the developing world, who aspires for a more, you know, prosperous lifestyle. Uh, it is in the interest of each one of us, as human beings that aspire for happiness, that this is the way to live. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's more, I suppose in the end, I'm trying to kind of, you know, play partly a devil's advocate. Sure, that's, um, because but I, th I think implicit, though, is even in the words you use, it's really everyone is aspiring not necessarily for a more prosperous lifestyle, but we're aspi aspiring for a happier lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. And the confusion is that sure. somehow more is going to constitute sure. happiness, more of something. Sure. And in this case, maybe uh, more is less, so sure. to speak. In other words, actually, the, really the sense of well-being and flourishing sure. right. doesn't necessarily come from living on the edge, having credit cards, that, bills that you can barely pay every month. Yeah. But that seems to be the paradigm that's, been, that's developed, even in the consumer cultures. Sure. Sure. So I think that you know, there's a challenge there is what's the good life? What's the new vision of the exactly. good life? Yeah. It doesn't have to be you know, in rags on the street. But there needs to be an, an alternative yeah. vision of the good life. But Dikila had a point. Um, I just wanted to build on actually what Greg had said earlier and then what Jimbala is saying now. And what you were talking about is an 
it's actually the infrastructure that, that needs this energy. It, the habit exists with the infrastructure. And so I think, uh, for me, I see a great deal of hope. And if there are any investors in energy that are watching out there, I would request that you invest in clean energy for the third world, because this is where infrastructure is just being developed. And this is where I think there is a great deal of hope for innovation. There was recently a video that went around Facebook where they were showing this young Malaysian man who had gone in and taken Coca-Cola bottles and put it in the roof and had put water in and was, I mean, th this is such for incredible, yeah. yes, yeah. For, for solar, oh, for directly solar using energy. solar energy. And um, it was so innovative and it was so simple. And it was so simple because this person didn't let any of the barriers he deals with on a daily basis get in the way. He just sort of, you know, decided that he wanted light in his house and then was handing it around to all neighbors. So I think, I think if we can go, going back to instead of preaching, if we're actually investing, that's the real solution. Um, I personally can be very skeptical about red and mechanisms that are about payment for environmental services, but that is a fair mechanism because yeah. that way we're not just giving aid to a third world country and um, you know making them dependent creating another habitual tendency by making them dependent on foreign aid we're actually saying that here here is the price for environmental services and this is your right to have it yeah. and I think that is a fair transaction we live in you know I am a consumer I like bags <laughs> I will <laughs> confess <laughs> as a transparent person here in this meeting it would be very hard for me to give that up, unless my master said, take on robes. No more <laughs> and bags. So, no more bags. So, so I think the question is, what is realistic? And we have grown up in these societies forming these habitual tendencies. It is a little unrealistic that we will get evolved within 30 seconds. It's going to take us, I think, a lifetime, if not more, to go through the evolution. So the trick is, what is the incentive to make us want to evolve? And that cannot be preaching, that cannot be, you know, um, aid. It has to be, we have to find the right incentives, including competition. I mean, a lot of what I, the reason why we buy these things and the reason why we're in a consumer society is because we're keeping up with the Joneses and India wants to be like China and China wants to be like the US and, you know, it's all the way down to the individual level. So why don't we harness that, that motivation, which is wholeness said today is a positive, can be a positive motivation for for a sustainable future. Healthy competition. Uh, Roshi, did you have a comment? No, no, no. I'm okay. Just, uh, Jonathan? No, I, I actually only want to re-emphasize what Dekila said, uh, which is that uh, it's not necessarily that we need to ask everyone, especially developing countries, to consume less. It's not practical immediately, but it's to evolve differently. It's, it's not a matter of either or, either more or less, it's, it's different. We have developed and grown our economy based on oil and coal. Now we know better. We know it's dirty, it's harmful, uh, and there is new technology. And you know, I think both Tequila and Diana have talked about technology transfer to developing nations. It's very important that, that we Low carbon, low, carbon tech, low carbon technology transfer, that it's really important that we help the developing world um, come up to standards in a better way than we did ourselves. And well, it's, they help us and, come down to those Well, that's too. We need to meet halfway. I think uh, His Holiness talked Thank about you, the middle way forward. So. Yes, well, and, and I think part of what Part of what's the, the history of the mind and life dialogues is part of what we learn from contemplative traditions like Buddhism is actually that part of, the, that the good life can also be constituted by a state of mind and that happiness is not necessarily about what we think it might be, that is to say, more goods and services. So that's, I think, a very more, important issue. More, I more, see Sally and then oh, Dan. I just finally, you know, just so it's a practical thing, as a metaphor, you think about more cars more traffic jams, right? And the most developed and modern city in the world has multimodal transportation, lots of opportunities. So I, I think it's simple. When you look at developing countries and cities in developing countries, I don't see sidewalks. I don't see anything like that. And they are following our bad habit in the worst way possible. And I think it's important to get that message. Sally, you had a comment, and Dan? 
as the interim, um, while we're in transition, we need to work within the system that we have and do the very best. And so all these suggestions, I think, are very valid. At the same time, we need to be constructing a new vision of how we live at a very deep level. This is happening, I think, with the education of our children. They are already being introduced to the new world view of interdependence and interrelationship. Um, what has, has surfaced several times in our conversation is some basic changes in the economic it model that we have. That is, now we are imprisoned in the consumer model, and it's uh, the meanest kind of capitalism possible. There are other kinds of economic systems. Economic systems are models, they are interpretations, they are not descriptions of the way things have to be. It is possible for us to legislate in which just distribution and sustainability become key elements in our vision. It isn't the bottom line of just satisfying the stakeholders so that some money will trickle down to the poor people on the street, but rather it's a different way of constructing the economic system from the go. Now that's not gonna happen overnight, but this needs to, I think, occur at the same time that we're doing the best we can within the system that we have. And um, as we're changing the system, I'd like to suggest that we also change the material world, because even if we have a new system, if we still make bricks and glass and cement the way we have for some of them two or 3,000 years, we're using uh, antiquated models that are very costly in terms of energy, in terms of toxic offputs and so on. What we also need is to be smarter about the material world and to really uh, generate more innovative thinking. For example, a brick is made uh, industrially by heating uh, clay and, and some chemicals to uh, a couple thousand degrees for many, many hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. Uh, and we've been doing it the same way for two to 3,000 years. How, there, someone just invented a new technology for bricks that's much less heat, much less hours. It's this kind of continual upgrade in the uh, infrastructure that we also need, which is also, by the way, an enormous entrepreneurial opportunity. And it may be a way to help developing countries and to find new growth tips that will employ people rather than just putting them out of jobs by consuming less. So not just consume less, change the system, but be smarter. Well, I think that also points to something that His Holiness says uh, uh, repeatedly, which is the science actually can be a huge motivator here. Here we're talking about sort of technological advancement, but as we learn more, we're discovering that the environmentally unfriendly way in which we live and the consumer culture that is supporting that is just not scientifically, doesn't even make that much sense scientifically. I mean, we, it, it's headed toward an endpoint that is not a very nice world in which to live. And the transparency systems that Greg is talking about all of a sudden make visible the invisible for us, which is, you know, everything in this room, everything we're wearing, amongst robes excluded, of course, uh, has costs that we don't even know about. Yes. That, and now that we can know them, we can make choices that will favor and, in fact, put money on the new better ways, which will be a driver for that innovation. Right. In other words, sometimes, you know, we can get into the attitude of, of in a sense, almost punishment, you know, or denial, but there's also real benefit that comes from following the science. But I think, uh, Elka, did you have something? Yeah, I just want to make the point. For the last few minutes, we've been talking about sort of more systemic solutions you know, that address many of these problems you know, so simultaneously, and the, the reducing the disparity in income around the world, which then re lead to a reduction in the disparity in consumption, you know, clearly is very important. I just want to add one additional sort of action item uh, to that list, which is the empowerment of women. You know, we talked about a lot about the, you know, the effect on population growth, but it has you know, ramifications on many other dimensions. I think we definitely should add that to the list. Yes, Thank you. yes, that's a very good point. I mean, you mentioned, I think it is the Marcia Sen's work that demonstrates that the education level of women is directly proportional to uh, uh, leveling off of the population growth and that education of women is so incredibly important. You know, it certainly seems, it, it, it's interesting to note that women <coughs> seen culturally, at least in many cultures, to be more inclined toward environmental friendliness, so to speak. It's really fascinating. 
maybe one other point uh, for future meetings, you know, as we think about how to implement these changes, you know, be they sort of small uh, local level changes or more systemic changes, we have to add other disciplines to the mix. You know, so we have psychology here, which is great, but we have to add economics, we have to add political science. I'm sure that point will be taken into account. I can guarantee that. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> you know, one other thing is, Solon, as I imagine, will probably be joining us fairly soon. But I was, one thing I've been curious about that we've mentioned a few times in conversation at lunch and so on, to turn to some of the practical things that are going on around us now in the world, is we've mentioned red. Would someone be willing to describe what that is and how that works and uh, how that might, uh, what impacts it have and how it even reaches the individual level? Could someone do that? You try it, then I'll... I know what it stands for. You know what it stands for. What, no, red no, is, this is changing all the it's time. It's changing all the time. So yeah. it's reduced emissions from yeah. deforestation and degradation. And degradation. Yes, but now it's red plus. Now it's red plus red plus. Plus. Red <laughs> plus plus. So um, red is basically the idea that most of the carbon is stored in forests. And the idea is that if we actually... Um, because of the high rate of deforestation, there's a lot of carbon that's going out in the atmosphere and, and in, um, contributing to global warming and climate change. So the idea is that there could be a financial, global financial mechanism that encourages people to actually not deforest and reforest instead. And so this mechanism, you know, first world countries, um, are also several third world countries, but um, many governments would put money into this mechanism and that wherever a government actually made a commitment to protect a forest, they would actually be able to get some of this funding. So it's, it's a it financial incentive mechanism. The reason why it's called Red Plus Plus, one is because of biodiversity, because if you're actually, a lot of people can make the argument that they're gonna conserve a forest and it could just be a plantation that, you know, of, of exactly the same trees, which has no biodiversity value. So the plus, one of the plus comes in because we're saying that biodiversity has to be a criteria for a good red project. What's the other, is it health? Uh, indigenous rights. Indigenous people's rights. And then the other one that's come in quite a bit is that there is a great deal of concern from indigenous peoples and tribes saying that, you know, well, what happens to our rights? You know, because we actually live in the forest, so we use the forest. So any project that actually protects indigenous people's rights gets the other plus. So this is a criteria for what a good red project would look like. I do have to say that it's still being designed at the moment. There are actually plenty of voluntary carbon markets that could work instantly or are working at the small scale level. But what RED is trying to do is get all the global governments to agree to it. And that's where the challenge is right now. Um, I'll just add one thing. There, there are two ways of thinking about these transfers of money to developing countries within what we think of as the sort of uh, climate agreements. And one is as a payment for environmental services. So wealthy countries would transfer money for forest protection because those forests are the carbon sinks and the source of oxygen for the whole planet. But there's also a more um, uh, sort of market-driven pattern where a country or a company that's having a hard time reducing its emissions can invest in protecting forests or wood stoves for poor women in India um, as, and then get credit for that. No, solar cookers for Well, women. solar cookers or efficient wood stoves. Efficient wood stoves. It can be a, it's a, there's a whole range of technologies. Yeah. And um, that, what that gives you is a credit that you can use to meet your own obligations. So this is the idea of carbon offsetting. And it's controversial, but it can be done in a way that is uh, sustainable and reduces greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So there's a debate, for example, if you've got $20,000 to invest in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, do you do something selfish and put solar panels on your roof that save you money and reduce emissions? Or do you take that $20,000 and give it to an NGO that's giving people efficient wood stoves? Because you might actually get more greenhouse gas emission reductions for that money. So there's a massive debate where some people say this is a good way. And I actually do offset when I fly because, because of that. But other people see it as a sort of paying 
other people for our carbon sins and that idea of medieval <laughs> indulgences. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's an excuse for business as usual. Right. It doesn't really get to the root of the problem. But could it be a good transitional yes, mechanism transitional. toward another kind of economy? I think it's a voluntary option on Expedia that you can actually yep. do, do an offset while you're buying. And I think it calculates for you how much how much carbon you can restore back into the ecosystem based on the length of your flight. Yeah. I don't think most people even look at it or know that it exists, and that's part of the challenge is the awareness raising. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many voluntary mechanisms that exist out there, so many NGOs that are working on this, biogas that, you know, the, the different projects that exist, solo it's re panels. solo panels. Yeah. So it's really a question of, instead of just getting one company or an individual to invest in this, if we can get sectors to invest in this, and any of you who have that sort of influence, I mean, that, that is a huge transformational change. Hmm. Elga. Just, just and then John. Very quick, very quick follow up on that. John uh, asked me yesterday whether or not vegetarian meals should be a default on airlines. Yes, default. We, but carbon offsets should be the defaults on airline tickets. You know, if we don't want to pay for them because we don't believe in them, that's fine. But maybe for all of us, that should be the first thing we think about. You know. But we, we spent a long time trying to persuade British Airways to do it. And then the environment. Use a mic. Oh, sorry. Um, we've tried to persuade, um, through my Oxford affiliation, a lot of group uh, airlines to do it. And they, they won't move from opt in to opt out. But uh, there are companies that have done it. Land Rover now, if you buy Land Rover in Europe, you offset. I mean, this is an SUV, of course, but <laughs> they will offset. <laughs> no, but they're trying to do the right thing. So <laughs> you will offset the first 35,000 miles of driving and manufacturing, and they've made it an opt-out, and 95% of people or something are uh, maintaining it. So wow. I think you know, it is an option for people, but you have to know that your offset is a good project and is legitimate, and there has been some debate about all of them being good or not. If I can just make one clarification on behalf of the forestry experts. Um, the foresters tell me that uh, there's a distinction between an intact tree, especially in a primary growth forest, versus planting new trees. And we've talked about offsets and planting new trees. And um, the, the car my understanding from the forestry sector is that the carbon locked up in old growth trees is the most valuable to be locked away. And that uh, when we talk about, if we were to ever sacrifice large trees and primary virgin forests to grow more trees, that's the wrong way to go. And in fact, there are uh, schemes for bioenergy, biofuels, like palm oil plantations. And there, there's research that shows if you were to cut down a, an existing forest, and grow biofuels in the place that the forest was, it would take over a thousand years to, to recoup the My carbon goodness. you just lost. Whereas if you took a degraded pasture uh, already, it's degraded land, and there you plant trees, that's where you get uh, carbon sequestration and more value added. Yeah, I see. But, but, mm. um, just to make sure people aren't confused, red is not reduced emissions from uh, reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. It's not about planting new forests. It's about protecting the old forests. And that's why people support it. But yeah. we were on the topic of offsets. Car carbon off I was trying to clarify about carbon offsets. Yeah. And I actually, I have, I have a, now that we're on uh, the topic of offsets, and I'm sure we could debate it at length, yeah. but uh, I am curious, I I those of you who know about the offsets, is it overall a... Uh, is it just really a short-term kind of mechanism toward transition? Yes. Or is it a long-term solution, the idea of an offset? No. Short-term. It's really probably a short-term mechanism toward transition. You have an opinion, yeah. Greg? It's a very technical explanation about why it's short Let's hear it. Yeah. Go ahead. Diana, oh, please give it. it. You don't want to do it. it it's a, I mean, uh, basically, we need a global cap on emissions. Right. And this... Uh, so once you have a global cap on emissions, offsets really don't work technically. So they're a transition. Only a little bit within the cap. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're a way to get some faster emissions as we move towards a global 
uh, fast emission reductions as we get towards a global cap on carbon. Right. Because, well, I'll just leave it at that. All right. So that, that makes sense. But, Greg, you had a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, then. I was just asking it, uh, clarification to Diana. Diana. Then, uh, just out of curiosity, um, for these various offset programs that are being offered, yeah. whether it is airlines or others, um, generally, what do they do? I mean, do, do, what do they do with the money? Do they give it to some NGOs, or do they have their own? I mean, what do they do? Um, well, I'll I'll just talk about um, one offset company, and their. If you offset your flight, it might cost you know $30 that for your carbon, personal carbon yeah. tax. That's the way I think about it. Uh, they'll take that $30. Some of it, like any company, will be for operating the company. And then they will give that to sometimes an NGO, sometimes to projects they've developed in countries. So for example, um, well, I, I should uh, be transparent. And I've just supervised 20 different graduate dissertations that have evaluated offset projects in different countries. And um, some of them are solar energy projects in rural Guatemala. Some of them are efficient wood stove projects in Madagascar. Some of them are wind farms in China, which is where people sort of say, well, should China really be having offsets? Um, but that's within the carbon market. Um, and some of them are small scale hydro projects. So. They're, they're projects that wouldn't have happened without your money. That's supposed to be a legitimate offset. It's a project where they would have uh, had a generator using fossil fuels, and by your, off your offset money coming in, instead they have solar energy or wind. So that's what we call an additional carbon reduction, that it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Is that... No, so you. it seems like, at least in the short term, it it's not unreasonable, unreasonable to say, let's say one reduces one's meat consumption to once a week or twice a week, saves uh, whatever amount of money, and uses that money especially to devote to offsets, for example, in one's travel and so on. Would that be a reasonable way or not? That's not fair because you're, not, you're actually uh, uh, you're cheating, aren't you, if you do that sort well, of thing? I, I, think the, I think that you should only use carbon offsets after you've done everything possible to reduce your own emissions. Okay. And our research has shown that individuals and companies that do offset are often the ones that have done the most to reduce their emissions. Okay. Um, and what you're doing, it's a really quantitative calculation. You say, okay, I've reduced my carbon footprint from 15 tons a year to four tons a year, but it should only be two, so I'll offset those two tons. I think if you save money from... Um, you know, all you the should, things Greg suggests, uh, you, you should, should do what Greg early. <laughs> No, I think, you, I, I think you should do good and relieve suffering based on what I've learned this week. And carbon... Well, you can retire early <laughs> and relieve your own suffering. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that in, in some ways we are certainly also faced with the necessity of some kind of a change globally in terms of our paradigm, our sense of how we live well, or maybe wild space. Uh, I think His Holiness is going to be here relatively soon, but I'm, I didn't discuss this with any of you, but I'm curious if there are ideas, you know, sometimes uh, the concept of a, of a lifestyle change can be quite difficult, um, and uh, unless it's forced upon one, and even then it can be very difficult. I'm wondering if there are ways in which maybe Sally, you have suggestions, or are there, are there projects, field projects, or ways in which persons can sort of experience a little taste of their wild space, of living in a, in a very simplified environment? Even temporarily, even just a weekend. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a very good question. The notion of wild space is based upon the conventional uh, Western male who is fit and trim, uh, educated, probably white, uh, hasn't really known any kind of deprivations or discrimination. He simply is the hegemonic human being. <laughs> and anybody who is not, doesn't fit that description <laughs> in any sense has a little bit of wild space. That is, you're outside the norm and you think, well, I'm not fit and trim, or I'm not male, or I don't have the... 
PhD. Um, but if you do fit those patterns pretty much, and a lot of middle class folks do, then you almost have to create some wild space. That is, you're so comfortable within most of the categories of the conventional worldview that um, it doesn't really bother you that much. <laughs> so you've got to, I mean, say you take on, even when young people travel and go into developing countries and experience for the first time what it's like not to have a good bathroom or the food that they like, it is a disorientation, a movement outside the box where you can begin to think differently. And so any, any pattern that you can develop or experience which allows you to imagine an, another possible way of living. To imagine another possible way of living. This is going to be a simple example, and uh, my children will probably be upset with me for choosing <laughs> it. But when I was 10 years old, uh, during the Second World War, I wanted to join the Navy. And uh, I didn't want to be behind a desk somewhere. I wanted to climb up on the ropes, yeah? yeah. So, I mean, I knew I couldn't do that, and I was willing to wait till I was 18, but I realized the problem was not. Even when I got to 18, I couldn't do this because I was a girl, and I was only 10 years old, but I realized there was something wrong with the conventional understanding of what girls could do and what boys could do. And even at a young age, you have some of this wild space in which you say, things are not right. Things should be different. I think those people that are uh, protesting, uh, the Wall Street protesters now, which have gone all around the world, they are saying, they don't even know, probably know how to express it. But they're saying something is wrong with this system, really wrong. Not just in the cosmetic changes, but in its basic fundamentals. We need a different economic system. They probably couldn't express it that way. But they know that it isn't fair. So your wild space is some of the most precious space that you have. Uh, never underestimate its possibilities. It is what allows us to dream and to dream differently. One of the great things about being a human being is that we help construct the reality in which we live. We live within our worlds, but we have constructed those worlds. And it can be a different world. When I grew up, it was a man's world. And that's why, as a 10-year-old, I couldn't join the Navy. They'll probably take you now. They would probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Diana said they'd probably take Sally now. I'm I, not so sure. I, I think <laughs> I have another problem, yes. and that is I'm too old. <laughs> Ageism. <laughs> Matt you, please. Thank you, Sally. To tell you about a wild space hermitage, which is entirely brick with solar cooked bricks, no heating for any number of hours. It has cold water, uh, winter and summer, coming from a spring with no transportation. Uh, it is 8 feet by 10 feet inside. Uh, there's no heating, of course. And um, what else? Um, uh, all what you need is a nice ca woolen cape and a nice hat. And it's not the internet. Not at all. <laughs> no internet. <laughs> and it's a very, very nice place to be. <laughs> Invite, and you're inviting and I'm everyone dreaming here. to go back there soon. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy your retreat this I just, year, uh, Yes, I wanted Zen. to um, tell Sally about a, a wonderful wild space opportunity for anybody, which uh, Bernie Glassman, who runs the Zen Peacemakers, has. Um, uh, it's a, a sashin, a, a Japanese uh, Zen retreat, uh, which is held on the streets of a city, and you live as a homeless person. And that's pretty wild. Yeah, it is wild. And I think you've done it, haven't you, Jen? Well, yeah. I mean, um, I think this work that Bernie is doing is just so important because it means we're stepping out of our frame of reference where we feel safe and familiar, and we have the opportunity to look out of the eyes of the so-called other. And suddenly, the, you know, our behaviors, which have created, actually conduce to homelessness. Um, uh, negative homelessness, I mean, there's homelessness and homelessness, but, you know, adverse homelessness. Um, the behaviors which conduce to it uh, become very apparent to us. Also, the treatment of people who live on the margins of the world that we think, you know, have value. Um, this is uh, critical. You and become Sally, invisible. And Sally, I think this is one of the functions of uh, pilgrimage in Buddhism. 
Um, that is that, you know, we leave our monasteries and we have a chance to, you know, go to holy places. But those holy places often, like Mount Kailash, are places where a um, tremendous amount is asked of you physically and also psychically. And it is, these are places of just tremendous power. And um, having visited some of these places as a pilgrim, I have to say that um, one of the things that I've hoped for, having been to circumambulated Mount Kailash seven times, and seeing the increase of trash there over the years, uh, since 1987 until now, is just really uh, devastating what's happening to that mountain. Um, that um, there would be a call among Tibetan people uh, and also among Chinese people who have the kind of respect for wild space, um, that we also take care of these holy natural places where uh, the narratives of our culture are also held. I mean, there are more stories around Mount Kailash or more stories in the, you know, the sort of... Uh, uh, shape of the Himalayan mountains that um, relate to the history and culture of Tibet or the Himalayan peoples. But we are slowly degrading not only these physical environments, but also the, the social um, dimensions through the narrative uh, aspects of what uh, the natural world is about. Thank you, Roshi. And uh, we were referring, just for, for your information, uh, to the Zen peacemaker, Peacemakers, that's uh, Bernie Glassman's uh, movement, if we can call it that. And I'd also mention also uh, Roshi Joan Halifax's Upaya Zen Center, which is a place where I have been and where there's some wild space to be had as it well. It is a wild space. <laughs> but I will say, I, you know, just personally, um, there is the Zen Center, but I also live in a, a valley that's surrounded by three million acres of national forest where we're completely off the grid. So, you know, that's where I go in order to restore myself so that when I, you know, come back into, you know, into the monastery or into conferences like this, I have had the experience of being really restored, revivified by being in the natural world in conditions where actually we don't have plumbing. I won't say you know more about that, but you can absolutely imagine um, where uh, the the, elect the electrical issue is addressed actually through solar and also solar gain, etc. So I think it's important that people have refuges. Take this time, the backward step, and Master Dogen called it, to step away from the so-called civilized world and move into the wild space that. Uh, Sally has been talking about. John, just a final. Um, yes, please. Since we are on the topic of, um, you know, fundamental shift in the way in which we envision our life, um, and uh, you know, questioning assumptions underlying our consumerist model of life and society, one of the things perhaps we need to take also into account is our, you know, I mean, many of the things that environmental protection demands on our part is to kind of accept some degree of inconvenience because a lot of the life, you know, lifestyle choices that we make in a consumerist model has to do with convenience and efficiency. And we tend to kind of, you know, uh, define efficiency in terms of speed. So the speed and efficiency seems to go together and the convenience is a very important kind of ideal and a societal value. So I think perhaps that's another concept, you know, alongside consumerism, we need to question this, you know, this convenience as a kind of a, you know, a, a value. Yeah, as as a value, because for example, um, you know, uh, this is, you know, I don't want to sound uh, self-referential, but for example, if someone takes instead of keeping two cars in the family, takes the public transit, say there is from your residence to the downtown city, there is only one hour, one train a day, you know, one one, one train per hour during the rush hour there might be plenty but during the you know uh, middle of the day only one you know one train an hour so which means you have to time yourself to be able to catch that train which may involve you know sitting half an hour waiting at the train station so people always read you can take a book you know i mean you either you read that book at home or you read it at the train station it's the same thing so these are things which you know, as a tiny things, but it really matters. And we tend to take convenience and efficiency and speed for so much for granted in the West that we don't really 
question the underlying assumptions behind this. That's another thing that I think we also need to um, bring up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, and maybe for others, uh, just Sally, uh, just a moment, but uh, I think that the issue of convenience is often connected to the speed of life. Yeah. And there is certainly a kind of intensity of the speed of modern life in the West, the life that many others maybe aspire to, <laughs> that seems to require convenience. But actually, one could ask, you know, if one didn't have that convenience and therefore life had to slow down, might that actually be more enjoyable? Definitely. Might it be more enjoyable to relax in the train station and read a book a bit? I mean, we have this image sometimes that the, the life of... Uh, voluntary poverty or simplicity requires us to be dressed in bark, you know, disheveled with the sure. bird's nest in our hair and, <laughs> you know, barely enough to eat. But the image of the, uh, one image I have, one of my favorite images of the person with a very simple life is Mathieu Ricard, actually, who has written a book about happiness, a rather good one, I'll say. And that, I think, is an image of, uh, you know, I mean, this is a person, no, no offense, Mathieu, I hope you don't mind if I, uh, if I laud your, your happiness right now, but here's a person <laughs> living a very, very simple lifestyle who seems to be really quite happy. There's even experimental evidence for it, I think, <laughs> according to <laughs> Richie Davidson. So simplicity doesn't have to mean deprivation. It's true. There's no question about it. That's Sally? Well, another example uh, also of the ways that the change in our worldview can come about. It sounds like an abstract thing and very, very difficult. But one of the huge changes that has happened in our acceptance of what is the normal picture of the world is the status of women in the West. Now, um, Elka raised the question of the status of women in most of the world it is abysmal. But during my very lifetime, since I was 10 years old, until now when I'm 78, there has been a paradigm shift in the common understanding so that one has to say now that the hegemonic human being is not just a male, but also, at least in the West, a female. So individual wild space can be an indication and a impetus to public changes of enormous importance. The status of women in any culture is a deep indication of the health and well-being of the entire culture. Thank you very much, Sally. Well, we're waiting patiently for His Holiness, and uh, we could certainly go on all afternoon, I'm sure, but I'm thinking that while we uh, have the gathered monastics here and other members of the Tibetan I community he's coming, yeah. available. He's coming now? Uh, maybe. There's some it's stirrings. The movement. movement in the background. Yeah. But I would invite, while there may be an opportunity, there may be time now for some comments or questions, maybe some of our gathered monastics might have a question or a comment or my... Love Zanla? Did you share that? Can we get a mic that we can hand yes, over there? Mic, yeah. I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Venerable Losan Tenzin, the founder and director of the uh, Emory Tibet Partnership and the Emory Science, Emory Tibet Science Initiative, to make a comment. Because we haven't heard enough, really, from this group, distinguished group. Well, thank you, John, for the opportunity. Um, this has been a great experience, a uh, great learning for me uh, with such great minds. Um, I think, you know, in Buddhism there is a motto, and that is Dunyung uh, Janyung, the, the very motto in the, the Vinaya, in the, the Buddhist, for the Buddhist monastic order, is what well, is uh, fewer needs, fewer deeds. And that's exactly <laughs> that what uh, Geshe Jambala was saying, you know, that the, the, our accelerating speed, that that uh, with which we are mo moving, it has it's based on how much want we have, how, how what how much need we put on ourselves. So I think that the, this ties to the greed. You know that uh, Franz De Waal, the, the the biologist, um, has written a book called the the, uh, the Age of Empathy, and it starts with the um, greed is out, empathy is in. <laughs> you know. But it, it's, it's very telling in the sense that we are at a place where we are seeing the, kind of the, the consequences of this unchecked greed that our society, 
that um, has kind of the, the uh, you know, priced or the valued this individualism. That, that uh, you know, where um, that if you can uh, maximize your profit, you know, within a set kind of the the regulations, you can do it. You know, it doesn't matter that who gets hurt in the process. And I think that the empathy, you know, that is becoming much, much more clearer now. The need for empathy, and uh, this is what I, I think that what uh, Sally has been saying that how t it has to do with, you know, that, uh, the fundamental world view that we hold it has a tremendous impact. That that's what Geshe Jimbala has pre presented with the Tawa Chuba. Yes. And the gom, you know, view, that, that, view that, meditation and action. The view that our perspectives that leads to our behavior or the action, and the how do we, in, you know, deepen that the, the question that Sally asked yesterday? How do we bring that awareness to deep, you know, to deepen that awareness? And that's the meditation. Meditation doesn't mean sitting cross-legged on a cushion, you know, in a Buddhist setting. It simply is a process of deepening our you know, fine-tuning our perspective, uh, if it is, you know, it's familiarizing, it's deepening. So I think that there is a, a really uh, an opportunity, and, and it's thanks to His Holiness Dalai Lama and the, many of the people here in this room, I mean, Adam, you know, that the, to have the kind of the, the courage to give that, the support to His Holiness's vision and Francisco Varela, you know, to, to create the, the, an institution like Mind and Life, I think that due to the efforts like this, that we are at a p point where there is a truly a great opportunity to draw from the modern science, you know, that is shedding more and more light into this fundamental nature about our living being. What is, the, the, what, what is it that drives our survival? What is it that, that's most crucial for our survival? Is it greed or is it empathy? And that's where that I think that new s insights that we are seeing is it is empathy, not the the greed. That is the glue to our you know society and our survival. So I think that the, the, I, the you know that uh, the the through these meetings, where the exchange is taking place between the contemplative traditions and the scientists, and the mechanism you know by which we can deepen this insight. Well, first, to shed light on, you know, these new perspectives, bring new perspectives. But then the process to deepen it, as Geshe Jambala yesterday showed, that through the mindfulness, you know, that basic, the most simple model that Buddha presented, the Eightfold Noble Path, or the Three Higher Trainings, that is it's the same thing, like the right understanding, or the right view, you know, leads to right motivation. You know, how do we deepen the right motivation and the, the, the view is through the right concentration, right mindfulness, and those have impact on our action, right action brings right action, right uh, livelihood, and the right speech. This, it's a, it, it, and this is where I think that the, the, the trainings like the mindfulness, the compassion, you know, for empathy, you know, that how do we do so. I think that the, these meetings, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, we are, just, you, know, you know, kind of in a way scratching the surface of this, but I think that it has a great potential. And uh, one thing that, uh, since John mentioned about the Emory Tibet Science Initiative, <laughs> I just want to say that uh, you know that uh, that uh, just being here in the presence of such uh, the great uh, scientists and the contemplatives. Uh, um, at it, and hearing all the, the, the presentations, it just really gives me I mean, that, you know, a, a deep, deep sense of uh, appreciation and just awe, sense of awe, to the vision that His Holiness the Dalai Lama has had. You know, that what an impact, what, how fortunate we are to have someone like him and uh, you know, to facilitate this kind of... Uh, the, uh, the exchange, but also the Emory Tibet Science Initiative. I think that the more and more I think of, you know, it's a project to create a comprehensive and sustainable modern science education for the monks and nuns. The many of the monastics here are from these uh, programs. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, you know, we struggled how to convince the people, you know, that the, 
the, the, the, what is the need for this program? So it, in the beginning, we had many uh, comments. People would say that, why do you want to corrupt you <laughs> know, <Buddhist> monks, <laughs> the, the, with the monastics with the science? <laughs> I mean, that, you, you will have all kinds. And uh, we struggled to, to really show you know, what's the real kind of purpose behind it. And uh, over the time as we thought more about it, my colleague, Yeshila Tola, you know, that who is, um, you know, to he was playing very cr a very critical role in this uh, kind of this really a, a movement uh, in, in some way, revolutionizing in, in a monastic education in a way. Uh, what is, has become clear is that His Holiness's vision here is not just to bring modern science to monks and nuns to give them some modern, uh, some scientific facts, but rather it is a way to facilitate a deep dialogue and exchange between the, the contemplatives who are the holders of this deep wealth when it comes to understanding mind and the emotions, you know, the processes by which to bring that understanding deep down to her heart. That can, you know, uh, spontaneously bring, uh, uh, spontaneously uh, be expressed into our action and behavior. And that's what I think that this, the, the program that the Emirates Science Initiative is really to expand the knowledge, but also for uh, uh, contributing to the humanity when it comes to facing some of the problems that we are discussing, you know, that cannot be uh, addressed simply by having more wealth or simply with the kind of the more materialistic, you know, gains, but rather trying to find that how we combine that knowledge with inner science of the mind. Thank you. Thank you, Lasana. Appreciate those comments. Thanks very much. The, uh, um, as as uh, uh, Geshe Lozen Tenzin said, a number of the monks here were trained for the Emory Tibet Science Initiative, have some education in science, and I think there may be some opportunities in the future for a more participation of monastics in these types of dialogues. But I wanted to return, while we're waiting for His Holiness, I wanted to return uh, for, to something that uh, Lozen said earlier on, which is actually an interesting idea, the role of empathy in all of this and the sense of connectedness that seems to be implicit in the environmental movement, but is also interestingly facilitated by some of our own modern technologies. You know, in the, um, in the context of what we sometimes call postmodernism, the late modern period in which we live, they, uh, some theorists, uh, such as uh, Peter Harvey, speak of space-time compression. The world has suddenly become much smaller where we can travel from one place to another so quickly, and our lives also seem to be so compressed. Well, one feature of that is the internet, actually. And I think the internet has become a tool, an important tool in this type of work. I wanted to mention, I remember, I just managed to remember that His Holiness the Dalai Lama had asked that I mention a website uh, that has been set up called echobuddhism.org, uh, spelled the way it sounds. And John Stanley, who is John, you want to stand up and uh, just uh, identify yourself? Where is John? Uh, in the back there. In the back somewhere, all right. Uh, uh, he, he is uh, responsible. There he is. Thank you, John. Hi, John. Uh, John is responsible for having uh, organized that website, put it together. It's got some information already on what's happening in the Buddhist world in terms of uh, the uh, response to the environmental crisis. And please have a look at it. His Holiness thing admires it quite a bit. I think we're now seeing the arrival of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. <laughs> please come in. <laughs> uh, Sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Your Holiness. I, I uh, uh, know you had a very busy schedule today. I think we still need to end by three o'clock. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So uh, I think we're going to need to shift our, our plan uh, and no. probably move uh, now towards some... Diego and... Yes. Yeah. I'm going to ask His Holiness for five minutes of concluding reflections, and then we'll move to... So, Your Holiness, we've had a really uh, great conversation. We wished you were here to join us, but uh, it nevertheless went quite well. 
and uh, I think we're all feeling quite motivated to see what might come next in all of this kind of work. But uh, if you would be willing, perhaps just for five minutes, mm -hmm. to give us some uh, concluding thoughts for the meeting, some of your final reflections to close our meeting. And then after you've offered your own reflections, a uh, few minutes of reflections, then uh, I'm going to ask first Diego Hangartner to uh, begin our closing from the Mind and Life Institute. But if you would please first offer some reflections. I think firstly, uh, this kind of dialogue, uh, since the beginning, the, because of the year by year, uh, increasing, uh, very, very encouraging. Uh, and then secondly, the people who participated are meeting, not just near sort of the uh, academic level, some of the talk, but seems to see uh, really some sort of sense of sort of because of the concern or feeling. feeling. Uh, so uh, I'm very much sort of because of appreciate. Now each of each of us, I think mainly you, uh, uh, see from one person to ten person, from ten person, hundred person, go like that, and particularly those who are because of the professors or some sort of people who have sort of close connection with number of students. institutions or students. Uh, uh, I think since we are for today uh, talking uh, seriously, is it how to improve our world, isn't it? Mm. So you see, when we uh, sort of scattered, right? Yes. When we go our own ways, oh. so keep this spirit, and then further sort of expand, uh, expand. Uh, and then myself, also till my death, I committed uh, uh, each day, uh, as soon as I wake up, uh, I remember Buddha, as a Buddhist, I remember Buddha, uh, and then some kind of, sort of uh, plan, one day's plan. Now at least this day, my body, my speech, my mind, dedicated well-being of sentient being. Uh, then, uh, that sort of the dedication, the uh, next, say, 16, 17, 18 hours, you see, keep that sort of that. Intention. Uh, intention, and occasionally watch. She's in there. Uh, monitor my own thoughts and uh, action. Uh, Sometimes deviation to the chicken. Sometimes I do observe some deviations. <laughs> <laughs> but at least it's better, you see, carry that spirit from early morning. Uh, so, till my death, I committed, make some kind of contribution, contribution, a better world, happier world. So, uh, you all, this is, I think, the same opportunity. Uh, of differences is I have the a big name of Dalai Lama. <laughs> 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 so previously, I think people a little bit sort of amused with <laughs> Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama. <laughs> I think nowadays seems to see not that kind of amused with <laughs> <laughs> amusement. <laughs> so people I think consider Dalai Lama is truly one human being. <laughs> so, uh, so this is my part. So you also, uh, same way, right? to make a contribution, contribution as much as you can. Then the last day come. 
last the breathing happen, we feel oh happy. Oh, so long I live. Um, I've been alive. Uh, I, I alive. I made some contribution. So then feel some kind of fulfillment of life. Mm. Uh, money at that moment more worry. Oh, the lot of money which I make. I, I, I made. Uh, I made through a lot of effort, including lies, bully, <laughs> all these things. <laughs> then, last moment, you realize no use. And more worry. Now, who will carry this my money? <laughs> uh, more worry. Isn't it? Uh, lead meaningful life at the time of death. Uh, no sort of slightest worry. I feel joyful. How I done? Whether this next life or not, I utilize my life, some meaningful. So no regret. Feel very happy. And we can say happily bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> So that I want to say, otherwise nothing. Then of course I'm looking forward to our next meeting. <laughs> uh, good. Thank That's you very okay. much, Your Holiness. Appreciate those comments very much. We really appreciate your time this week. It's been a lot of time, and we we know your time is very valuable. The Mind and Life Institute is very grateful, and I think uh, the Mind and Life Institute. We're all looking forward to the next meeting too. So may I please now ask Diego Hangardner, the Chief Operating Officer of the Mind and Life Institute to offer some thanks to many people who've gone into producing this meeting. Diego, please. Yes, of course. Uh, many, many people were involved in that, and I'll try to make it as short as possible. Foremost, thanks go, of course, to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Your Holiness, you have been an unserving uh, determination to help us and dedicated a lot of your precious time, and we're really grateful, and we try to do as best as we can to not squander these incredible opportunities. Also, our thanks go to His Holiness the Galvan Karmapa, who has given yesterday a wonderful talk about why he is involved in uh, the preservation of the environment and what the, are the initiatives that he has been uh, initiating. Then, of course, the big thank you goes to all of our speakers who have come from very far and the moderators who have dedicated not only this one week of their time, but also in July we met and discussed and shaped this program. And uh, that uh, really goes to a big thank you to all of you to have dedicated your precious time. And I'm looking forward to our next encounter wherever and whenever that will be. The planning committee has been wonderful to work with you, uh, Dan, John, and Jonathan. And uh, it has been really great to work with you. and mold these ideas and shape it into a program that we have been able to sort of put together and also execute. Then uh, this would not have been possible without the incredible support that the Hershey Family Foundation has been giving to us. Uh, it is all, over all these years uh, since the initiation in 87 that uh, the Hershey Family Foundation has been supporting these meetings with Your Holiness. So thank you very, very much. They also support other initiatives of the Mind and Life Institute, such as the Warella Awards, and uh, also other uh, events that are related to the advancement of this emerging field of contemplative science. That would also not be possible without the support of all of our other donors that have been contributing over many years uh, to the flourishing of this new area, and particularly to the Mind and Life Institute. Um, there is the private office who has been, as always, very wonderful to work with. Uh, I have been the liaison between the private office and uh, the Mind and Life Institute, and I really enjoy working with them, and I hope uh, to continue working with them over many, many years to come. Uh, the, particularly, Chimela and Tenzin Takla have been great supports and um, very dedicated. There are people that have not been able to understand the English, and so behind the scenes we have had a lot of people that made it possible, particularly Druk Tsering from Deradun and Tenzin Sepak have been translating 
all the proceedings here into Tibetan. So a big thank you uh, on behalf of the monastic community and the Tibetans uh, to goes to them also. And then also, uh, as we know, this uh, proceedings have been webcast. And we have had over 10,000 people that have been watching us out there. And so that would not have been possible without the support by, first of all, uh, the team that has been, and then also the, the wire and the technology behind all of that. Particularly thanks goes to Don, Jenjo, Lepa, Chimet Zogchen, and Pasang behind the cameras. For the Mind and Life side, I would uh, like to extend my thank you to the board and the Program and Research Council with whom we are working uh, regularly, meetings and uh, ongoingly, to really be aware of where do we want to take Mind and Life in the next phase. And so the guidance of every one of them has been wonderful and really that's why this group of and this sort of network of people is so incredible to work with. And then of course the Mind and Life staff, which, of which only sort of Dave and myself have been here. Uh, but the thank goes also to the office of the people who are back in uh, the US and also in other places of the world that help us with all of that. Then uh, another group that I would like to thank is we would not have come here without Middle Path. So they have been helping us to get everybody up here. And then on a personal level, I really would like to thank Adam that has been uh, instrumental and visionary and also inspiring in getting us all uh, on up to this level. And also thank you for being such a wonderful teacher. And then also thank you uh, to Betty, who has been uh, unwerving in the support to my activities. So thank you very much. Thank to you everybody. very much, Diego. And now I'd like to I'd like to ask uh, Richie Davidson, a, a senior and long-term member of the Mind and Life Institute uh, Board of Directors, to um, say a few words and introduce a very important person in the Mind and Life family. Uh, my, my principal task is to do that, but uh, before I do that, I want to just very, very briefly uh, say uh, to Your Holiness that your time and involvement with uh, us over the years has been uh, just uh, so deeply inspiring and it's difficult to overestimate its importance. One of the things I often tell people is that the scientists who come here to Dharamsala uh, to be in your presence leave differently than when they first came. They are deeply affected by uh, being in your presence and uh, we do the best we can to bring the best people in the world in their fields here to Dharamsala and they go back. These are the thought leaders in different areas of science and I think they're changed in very beneficial ways. So uh, I'd like to just uh, on behalf of the board of directors uh, to extend uh, a very, very deep bow of gratitude for your incredible time uh, that you give to us. Uh, I'd also like to thank Diego uh, for all of his incredible work uh, on behalf of Mind and Life, uh, both logistically and in many other ways. Uh, Your Holiness and other uh, distinguished assembled guests, uh, this is a very special moment in Mind and Life history. We are going through a transition and this is the last meeting uh, in Dharamsala at which Adam Engel, our chair uh, of the Mind and Life Institute, is present uh, in his role as chairman. And Adam has been uh, for 24 years uh, the co-founder of Mind and Life uh, uh, and uh, a real visionary and uh, a strategist uh, premier. And he has engineered this organization in ways that I don't think any of us dreamt about uh, when we first became involved. Uh, and Adam, through his uh, tireless work, uh, his commitment to the cause, uh, his uh, incredible ability to listen to scholars and uh, Adam is the first to say that he himself is not a scholar and he's been really very deeply 
humble about this, and he has had a quality of being able to listen to the scholarly community in ways, I think, that have enabled Mind and Life to rise to a certain kind of position where the rigor and the honesty and the ethical um, uh, sense that we bring to our mission has been recognized worldwide. Uh, and I think that the penetration of this collective dialogue uh, and uh, new kind of epistemology that brings together uh, the contemplative traditions and modern science uh, just could never have been done without uh, his uh, really extraordinary work. Uh, and so uh, it is really uh, my great honor to be um, Adam's close friend and colleague, and I'd like to just ask him uh, to please uh, uh, come up and, and say a few words. been through a lot since uh, 1983 when I first heard the rumor that you were interested in science and came up with this crazy idea to see if I could organize a science meeting um, with you. And um, uh, reflecting on what we've done together with Mind and Life, it seems to me that we've been through two developmental phases. Phase one started in 1987 when we started the dialogues and for a dozen years we pioneered how to develop rigorous dialogue between Buddhism and the science and the scholarly world. And then in 2000 we um, enhanced that dramatically by um, when you requested you know, that the uh, scientists and the scholars actually investigate contemplative practices uh, to see how they affect brain behavior um, and asked us that if, uh, if we found that they were beneficial to teach them in a purely secular environment. And that shift has been dramatic in the world, astounding. If we think back to the way the world was in 2000, um, and the way it is today, um, in terms of, um, uh, I mean, there, there was no, rep very, very little reputable research on uh, contemplative practices in those days. Uh, but through these dialogues, the establishment of the Summer Research Institute, the Varela Awards, we've now got contemplative studies um, uh, fellowships, we're applying for postdoc stuff, our Mind and Life International. Next year, we, um, we launch an international symposia. Uh, over this period of time, um, we have cultivated um, thousands of people, or a thousand people through our Summer Research Institute. There are now hundreds of scientists and scholars in the world that are doing this work. Um, in dozens of centers and laboratories, uh, Ritchie Center in Madison, Gimpelis Center at Stanford, uh, the Emory Center, and dozens more. Um, uh, there are faculty now that are receiving tenure in contemplative studies um, and contemplative science, and I suspect eventually there might even be a faculty departments on contemplative science and studies. Um, and um, Specifically, there's been a huge change in public awareness and public impact on the effects of contemplative practice, what I call mental and emotional fitness training on health and well-being. And my personal aspiration for Mind and Life has been that um, through our work um, and the work that stems from us, there is a global awareness 
of the value of ment purposeful mental and emotional fitness training and the, the, the fact that it can be done um, and that there are developed age-appropriate and culturally appropriate tools so that everyone in the world has the opportunity uh, to practice these in whatever way is most effective for them. Um, in educa education, healthcare, um, and uh, leadership in the workplace. Um, when we sat for the first time in, um, in 2000, or 1986, one of the things that I asked you was, um, what's in it for you? What, is it that, what, what are your desires here? And one of the things that you said at that time was that you wanted this education to go into the monasteries. And I just want to acknowledge um, how um, the Emory-Tibet Partnership and the Science for Monks has actually um, uh, done that. And I want to uh, just bring that to our collective attention and how, how uh, visionary that was and, um, and how gratified we all are that, this is, that we have contributed to that. Um, there are many, many people that have, uh, that have contributed to this over the years and many have been acknowledged. I especially want to bring into the room um, uh, your brother, uh, Nari Rinpoche and Tenzin Chogo, who was the original go-between uh, between us and who has been a champion of mine in life for, uh, for decades. And I won't take the time to re-echo re re what Diego and Richie have said, acknowledging everyone else here. Uh, but I do want to say that, um, uh, again, from the very, very beginning, uh, when uh, we first started talking about this, um, one of the uh, things that we asked was that you, not, that, that, that you participate fully, and I want to acknowledge how much you've done that, even the day that you won the Nobel Prize, and even the day that you went to the White House. And uh, from a personal point of view, um, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, and on behalf of my family as well for being my teacher, uh, my friend, and your, your kindness and generosity and blessings um, have transformed my life. And uh, I'm just incredibly grateful uh, to be able to use uh, my small skills uh, in service of your vision, in service of the Dharma, and in service of humanity. And, uh, and to acknowledge, uh, not only uh, for myself, but for my former wife, who established Peace Jam, and for my sons, one of whom is married to a Tibetan, and the other one who is in um, a three-year retreat. And um, finally, I just want to uh, recall that in 2002, when I came to Dharamsala just before um, uh, the, the Mind and Life meeting in 2002, uh, shortly after Francisco had died. And um, you had got, we had started our first public meeting in, in, uh, at Harvard, and then you had gotten sick and we had to cancel it. And Mind and Life was uh, virtually bankrupt. And I came here and I uh, remember I put a picture of Francisco on the table, and I said, Your Holiness, um, you know, is this something you want to continue to do? And uh, Francisco's gone. I think I even said, you know, we're not that far behind. And you looked at me very, very clearly and you said, um, the work that we're doing here together is much too important to depend on any one life, whether it be Francisco, whether it be Robert Livingston, who had recently passed, whether it be me or whether it be you. And you looked at me and you said, I want you to build this so that it outlives us. And I am just so incredibly grateful today to be able to look at you and say, mission accomplished. That's it. Thank you very much, Adam. We really appreciate it. And the Mind and Life Institute is very, very grateful for all of your wonderful work and contribution. We obviously wouldn't be here without you and your holiness. Thank you, everyone.